Uh, and it is interesting to me, though, how quickly we've gone. I think you say there's only about 4% support um, for suffrage mm -hmm. and for the SOBs uh, that are out there. If you guys don't know what that means, it's not talking about suffering under listening to feminists uh, have to speak to you day in and day <laughs> out about how they should get paid as much as you, but have a four hour day work week. Um, this has to do with like voting and actually having that contribution. Um, and voting is, is so much more than just like casting a ballot like today where they say, oh, everyone should vote. Everyone should vote. Voting used to be something respectable. It meant you were informed. It meant that you made, a, you know, you were a decision maker in the family. You were probably a provider. You paid tax. Taxes, there was something significant about it. So the move to suffrage wasn't just about giving women a voice. Because I always say this, women had a voice. Um, if women were married and women were in a family, then they would make united decisions and that men would vote in a way that that things would be uh, you know, beneficial for his family anyways. Because no guy, let's just be real here, no guy wants to piss off his wife and wants to have an unhappy wife at home, have a, a wife that feels like he doesn't provide. If anything, all men do is try to provide and work to make sure that their wife is protected, that she's provided for, and that she's at least happy to the extent that a woman can be. Um, and so so I, I don't understand, though, if, if only 4% of people were actually supporting suffrage, how did a movement like that actually gain enough votes or enough passing to become an, a, a national movement? And we look at like a civil rights victory. Yeah, well, that's a very good question. And I think it's one of the most important things that I detail in the book that I think most people don't know. Uh, it was a, a small group of intellectuals and then a small group of wealthy elites who were kind of in contact with each other, similar to now how you have academia and you have certain intellectuals, public intellectuals who kind of inform the politicians and the wealthy elites as to what the agenda should be, right? So we had this circle of intellectuals who tended to be very anti-Christian. They felt that Christianity, specifically traditional Christianity, because even in the 1800s, there was a progressive Christian movement happening. Um, and these people opposed the traditional Christianity. They felt like all progressives do that by having boundaries and roles and things like that, that it was limiting progress, right? And they were kind of proto new agers who wanted to see this futuristic um, melding of genders. People think this is new, but it's actually very old. This goes back uh, actually to ancient times, but there was a huge movement in the middle 1800s among fortune tellers, spiritualists, theosophists, and ultra progressive Christians. I wouldn't consider them to be, I would consider, consider them to be like heterodox Christians, but they specifically wanted to destroy the influence of traditional Christianity. And they thought the nuclear family was limiting things like sexual liberation. And so we need to tear all this down. We need to get rid of all this so that we can rebuild society in the image that we want. And of course, the wealthy elites of the time really loved this idea because the first industrial revolution had just happened. We had these huge transnational corporations for the first time, people like Rockefellers and Carnegie's, um, you know, railroad and oil magnates who wanted big factories with huge labor pools, very cheap labor, and politicians who wanted to double the tax base. So the same group, you might know about the Jekyll Island Club in 1910, who met at Jekyll Island in secret to uh, draft the legislation that would become the Federal Reserve Act, and then that would lead into the income tax in 1913. This same group of people um, wanted women's liberation because they thought if we can get women out of the home and have them working in factories or even have children, women and children working in factories, this will be great because we can, <clears throat> it will lower the wages because we'll have a surplus of labor all of a sudden. So we'll get cheap labor and we'll also be able to put children in daycares um, in the Soviet Union, they were called creches. And that will be perfect because they were just establishing the public education system at the time, which was designed by Horace Mann, Elizabeth Peabody, and others who liked the Prussian model, which was going to turn citizens into well-conditioned um, little corporate cogs in the wheel. And instead of teaching them like a classical education, we will train them to be good worker bees and good soldiers, 
good, obedient citizens, right? So, so if you're the elite at the time, this is a great plan because it gives you everything you want. So it was actually Alva Vanderbilt Belmont, who was married to William Kissam Vanderbilt, uh, divorced him, married his best friend, and was one of the first beneficiaries of getting a giant divorce settlement. She became one of the wealthiest women in the world at the time. Mm. And then her second husband, Mr. Belmont, who was a Rothschild banker, also died. And then she had this huge sum, this huge fortune, and she gave it all to the suffrage movement. She created their headquarters. She did most of, the, paid for all the marketing, uh, got all the suffragettes who were doing terrorism out of jail, things like that. So really without her and her influence, it would have taken at least much longer. Um, and then shortly after she funded that and suffrage was passed, we had like the Rockefeller family, the Ford Foundation, and all of these giant philanthropic entities also helping to fund and accelerate feminism because, again, they really loved this idea of we get all this cheap labor, we double the tax base, and then the children are in state institutions all day where we can basically train them and propagandize them however we want. So it gave them total control. Before we jump into the topic, spring is just around the corner, which means that we have time to finally plant our gardens. Maybe you know you have that fence between your house and your neighbor and you wanna grow some privacy shrubs. Perhaps you've been wanting to grow those fruit trees you've been wondering about and you haven't known where to get them. Well, right now at fastgrowingtrees.com slash SO, they offer a wide variety of plants, trees, shrubs, anything that basically grows, they know it, and they've got it for a wide variety of climates, no matter where you're living. And the best part is they actually offer support to make sure that you keep those plants growing and trimmed and working appropriately so you get the output that you want. I've used the shrubs on the outside of my apartment in order to block out the, the uh, neighbors. They can't see in. I also like their fruit trees. And the best part is when you go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash SO, that's F-A-S-T-G-R-O-W-I-N-G-T-R-E-E-S dot com slash the letter S-O for 15% off right now the entire store. You can get all the shrubs, trees, plants, anything you desire to grow in a wide variety of climates. So right now, make sure that you get ahead of spring, get the plants that you want, order them straight to your door. There's no mess. It's easy. You don't have to haul them in a car. You don't have to have a truck. They get delivered to you and they're great quality and awesome if you actually take care of them and get the support that you need. I promise you, you will not regret this. So go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash SO for 15% off. 